Mountain biking is for people of all shapes and sizes. And as GMBN's tallest in-house rider, I thought I'd share some of the tips that I've learned from years in the saddle to make riding that bit better, a bit more enjoyable and a bit more comfortable. Now, I'm not the tallest mountain biker out there by a long way. Several of my friends are towering above me at nearly 203 centimetres. That's about six foot seven, that's huge. However, years in the saddle have given me a lot of pain and discomfort. I've suffered from all the things that taller riders do suffer with. Lower back pain, neck pain, even wrist pain. And then of course there's awful handling and poor bike fit that's all associated with frames that really just aren't designed for taller riders. Okay, so first up, let's talk about frame and frame fit. Now this is something really, really close to my heart and I've got real strong feelings about because it's something that I've actually really struggled with over the years and something I've just learned to adapt around until I rode that Mondraker back in 2013. Now that bike really changed everything for me and made me reconsider how bikes should fit taller people. Now, if you want to see that video, there's going to be a link in the description underneath this one. Check it out. It's quite interesting, and it tells you why bikes like this new proof in front of me are so good today. Now, this, this bike is my personal. It's one of my favourites of I think I've ever had because it really does suit what I like in a bike. It's fairly short travel. It's got big wheels on it, and it's got a really generously sized frame. Now, this is key for me. The front end on this has a 515mm reach. That's one of the bigger sized bikes out there for a size extra large. Of course, there are some extreme options, but this is a bike that performs well in all situations. The more extreme offerings might be a bit more biased towards enduro racing. Like I said, it's got 515 millimeter reach on the front, but also out back it has proportional chainstay. So they're nearly 450 millimeters. Now that is one of the key things for me. I've ridden many bikes with long front ends, but quite often they have short back ends on them, and that's where they really fall down for a taller rider. The shorter the back end is, the further forward you have to have your saddle to try and get your weight in the middle of the bike, because weight distribution is everything when you're a tall rider. As you'll know, if you're watching this as a tall rider, from going up steep hills, how much you have to hunch down and weight that front wheel to stop it wandering around, and even to stop it wheeling, it can be really quite off-putting. If you have a longer bike in the front end, that's great because you can get more weight on the front end. But even better is if you can have more length on the rear end, which encourages your weight to naturally sit towards the middle of the bike. Having a kind of even bias to the front and rear wheel means not only can you basically ride a lot better and be a lot more comfortable, but it means you're going to be in more control of the bike. Now, don't forget, being taller, your weight normally is quite a bit further higher than shorter or average height riders. And the effect to that is when you're riding extreme terrain ups and downs, your body weight has to move backwards and forwards quite extremely on a bike to keep everything under control. Now, sometimes that can be quite upsetting and that can really sort of disturb the traction you have on your front and rear wheels, especially on the front. If you're maybe going down an aggressively steep descent and you're off the back, trying to stop yourself getting pitched over the front, but there's actually not enough weight on your front wheel for traction. It's a really fine line there. But by having a bike with the front end that's nice and long, and makes things a lot more comfortable, a lot more controllable, and it'll make you feel a lot faster and safer. And more to the point, more fun. That's what it's all about. And like I said, the long chains down the back, some riders in the past have said, no, they're not very playful, but it's all about the proportions. Yes, an excessively long chain stay won't be much fun, but a chain stay that is proportional to the front end of the bike, that is where you're winning. Now, this is a size extra large, and it's the biggest one that Nuke Proof make. This is the Reactor 290. Like I said, I love this bike, but there are bigger bikes out there. There's a lot of brands that make even bigger bikes, double XLs and triple XLs. Now, there's a few just firing by on the screen at the moment, just to give you some ideas. So if you're one of those taller riders that's on the extremes and pushing seven foot, you might want to look at some of those brands. Now, as bikes have got more modern, frames generally have got longer and your cockpit basically has got shorter. The whole effect to that is your wheels are further apart and you're more central on the bike anyway, so it's much easier for us now. In fact, it's better than it's ever been to get a really good bike that fits you. But if you can't afford to do that and you're thinking, oh, I'll just chuck like a longer stem on it and stuff, just be cautious of how far you go. Like I said, the further forward you put your stem, the further over the front wheel axle it is. You're actually going to ruin the handling of the bike. And you can't just go, say, for example, slamming the front end of a bike to try and keep your, your weight down because 
you're actually your weight's going to end up higher at the back and lower at the front you're going to be in an awkward position and more to the point this sort of thing is going to lead to pain long-term pain like neck pain if your front end is too low you're going to end up looking up all of the time okay next up then well it's the wheel size clearly 29 inch wheels they've got to be the best option for tall people right because they're big and they go over things there is some truth in that but that's not why big wheels suit taller people okay so if you skip back here to 26 inch wheels and if you think about where your bottom bracket axle is in relation to the wheel axles quite often it would be higher than the wheel axles now combine that with someone that's very high up and tall on the bike and you become very top heavy now look at a set of 29 inch wheels and look at that same line your bottom bracket actually has to be lower than the wheel axles to be proportional to the rest of the bike for handling otherwise you're going to be way up in the air and that alone is the reason that i love 29 inch wheels okay they've got some other great attributes as well which we're not going to get into now this is all about the bike fit and the bike comfort and getting the best out of a bike for a taller rider and for this reason alone that is why 29 inch wheels are superior for us they really do get you into the bike and I, I, I honestly I can't sell you on 29 inch wheels enough if you're a tall rider you know there's no problem with the handling at all you only get benefits if you're a tall rider and as an upside as well they make your bike look smaller and that is a huge thing because the size frames we're used to running back on a 26 inch wheel bike made the wheels look tiny and the frames are ugly look at this this is one of the biggest frames you can get and it's on 29 inch wheels and it looks amazing Okay, so next up is your pedals and cranks. Now, many taller riders, naturally you're gonna have longer legs, which means you're gonna want slightly longer cranks. And also, you're gonna have bigger feet as well. Now, I haven't got the biggest feet, I've got a size 46. I run a 175 mil crank. That's my preferred choice on any bike, regardless of the ground clearance. Purely because of the fact it feels most comfortable when pedaling. Now, some riders out there will say that by having a wider crank, your stance is slightly further apart and it's going to lower you, but you're talking like 10 mil difference. So um, I'm not sure that that is something you can notice, but perhaps if you're doing everything possible to lower your center of gravity on the bike, and that's one of the things that you can do, then I guess it would come into effect. But the size of your pedals, the shoes that you use, and the pedals that you actually use really do make a difference. Now, if you ride flat pedals, make sure that you've got a sole that's stiff enough on your shoe and you've got a pedal that's big enough as well. Because if you've got a pedal that's too small, you'll end up with cramps on the outside of your foot. Now there are several brands out there like Crank Brothers, for example, that offer pedals in different sizes to suit different sized feet. This is a godsend for taller riders because you can have that big platform that genuinely fits your feet. If you like clipless pedals like I do, then you've got choices there as well in two respects. The first one is the actual size of the pedal body itself. Now on my cross country bike, I like a very lightweight, minimal pedal, but I can get away with that because the shoes that I choose to use are proper XC race shoes. They're incredibly stiff, which means all your support comes from the shoe. And you don't need that with the pedal. But if like on this bike, you wanna have a bit more fun, then a bigger pedal is probably better because the shoe you're gonna be riding in is gonna be a little bit more flexible. Now at the moment I'm using a Shimano shoe. I absolutely love it. And the combination of that with these pedals is brilliant for me. Like I said, a 46 shoe. This is the Crank Brothers Mallet E. Some riders even go even bigger with the Mallet downhill pedal. Uh, this one suits me just fine. It fits the shoe great. And I'm also running the longer axles. You can get two lengths of axles in these and the same in Shimano options as well. A wider axle not only gives you a better stance, which is more stable and uh, more supportive for someone that's tall, but it actually keeps your big feet away from the cranks and away from the chainstays, which leads me on to something else. I've actually got chainstay protection on this bike, and it's not from flying rocks. It's from my ankles wearing out the paintwork on there that costs so much money. And it's well worth doing on your crank arms as well, if that's something that happens to you. Now, of course, this might just be a case of riding with your heels in, but generally, if you've got bigger feet, that is something that you're gonna suffer with. So definitely take that into account. Okay, so next up then is the cockpit of the bike. Now, if we just skip back again to 26 inch wheel bikes, like I said with the, the axle height thing a minute ago, 
There was another issue we used to have. We couldn't get the front end high enough because you'd have the seat post towering out the frame to have your saddle at the correct height for riding. And accordingly, your front end needed to come up because otherwise you'd be all hunched down like a roadie and you'd start getting the back and the neck pain, not to mention all the bad handling attributes that went along with that. Thankfully, with 29-inch wheels, it doesn't, well, it's not, it's not quite so bad, is it? The fact that your bottom bracket is that much lower in comparison to the axles, it means that your front end can be a bit lower as well. But don't get carried away with that. Okay, so a lot of the cross-country racers will slam that front end so their front end profile is really low, and that is great for an attack cross-country position. But I promise you, for real tall riders, it's not that comfortable for the long term. So don't be afraid to go a bit higher on the front end. If your bike fits you correctly in the length, going high is great. Now, this bike actually comes with a 50 mil stem as standard. I'm running a 35 on there. I'm running one spacer under it, which is perfect for me with the 140 mil fork that's on there. It has a 130 mil back end on there, so it's a good balance. Now, as far as the handlebars go, I've gone for a high rise bar. It's a position that works for me and it means I can ride all day, every day, and I get no back ache and no neck ache. So for me, that works, but you might want to experiment with the height of bars as well. Now it's a 38 mil rise bar on there, and it does make a significant difference to me. But the last thing really with your handlebars, we're tall, we have wide, well, a big wingspan, if you like, I certainly have. So I go for a full width bar every time, 800 millimeters. Now there are a few brands out there that offer wider bars, but I don't think there's any advantage to going any wider than 800. Uh, and if you ride any sort of single track, any wider than 800, you're gonna come into to problems. I've had many people tell me that 800 is too wide and they'll be running a 740 or a 760 because trails are quite nagery in and out of trees. And here and there, all right, you might see me with scrapes on my arms and on my fingers, but it's not often and I'm willing to take the chance to have the overall comfort, security and really enjoyment of riding a bike. 800 mil works for me. So if you're hovering around 200 centimeters, it probably is gonna work for you as well. And the last thing up front is really the size of your handlebar grips. Let's not forget that many tall riders have slightly bigger hands. Now mine aren't massive, but they're size 11, which is an extra large in gloves. Accordingly, when there's an option to have a thicker handlebar grip, I will always go for that. Thinner ones, 100% feel nicer, but you end up wrapping your hands around them too much. That can lead to knuckle pain uh, on longer rides or rougher rides. If you're riding a bike like this, you're gonna be riding it on rough terrain, so make it easier on your hands and try out a grip with either a little bit more padding or a slightly thicker grip. Now, if you don't want to go for a thicker grip, but you want a grip that's got a bit more padding, look for something that's kind of got the mushroom texture to it, the mushroom profile. It provides an enormous amount of comfort for something that doesn't necessarily have to be quite thick. Okay, next up is saddle height and position. Now, this makes a massive difference for taller riders. Now, if you're unlucky enough to have a bike that has quite a slack seat angle on it, what that means is the taller your saddle gets, the further over the rear wheel axle it gets. Now that's not good for climbing on steep stuff because you means you're gonna really have to hunker down over that front wheel. So running your saddle slightly forwards on those rails and even slightly nose down can help you sort of return a better position for climbing. Of course, there's a fine line between the angle of your saddle and that's something it does take a while to figure out. But a little cool secret I've found is using an e-bike saddle. Now, I discovered this on my EMBN bike, which is a specialized turbo Levo. Had an e-bike saddle, thought, really? E-bike saddle, what's so different about it? It turns out on e-bikes, you can ride up pretty much anything. So having a saddle with a shelf at the back really enables you to keep that power down and stay in a more efficient position. But I found it works brilliant for me on all bikes. I'm absolutely, I'm a convert on it now, although the one downside is it is a little bit harder to get off the back of the bike, but I found it ridiculously comfortable for basically all riding. Now you note that even though this bike doesn't have a very slack seat angle, I do prefer to run my saddle quite far forwards. Um, I have quite a short upper body with long legs and long arms, so it just works for me. But just note that the further backwards you run that saddle, the harder it's gonna be for you when you climb. Now with regards to a seat post, if you're lucky enough to be able to get a dropper post on your bike, go for the tallest drop you can. That's a 170 mil drop, 170 mil drop is absolutely fantastic because it means that you can get the saddle completely out of the way and keep your body weight really low down on the bike. The lower your body weight is, the more safe and secure you're gonna feel when you're riding off-road. Now, 
Now going hand in hand with your saddle position, and of course everything else on the bike, because it's all relative, is your shock setup. Now as a taller rider, fine, you might be a bit heavier, like that's not what we're gonna talk about here. The leverage that you have on your rear shock when you're climbing seated makes a big difference, especially if you have a slack seat angle on your bike. With a steeper seat angle, your body remains much more central on the bike, and as a result, you basically don't disrupt the rest of the bike so much. You can sit down and spin those circles. Whereas if you have a slack seat angle on your bike, your saddle ends up miles out here, and as a result, regardless of your suspension design, you can end up really wrenching through your lower back when you're climbing. Now, I used to really suffer from having a bad back, and it took ages to figure out why, because I was doing core stability exercises, the position on my bike wasn't that bad, the bike at the time was about as big as it could get, it was an old um, Ibis Mojo HD in an XL, I think I had a 70 mil stem, and probably an 800 bar or near enough to it. It was a bit as big as it could be at the time, but I really suffered from lower back pain. And I actually got to ride quite a lot with the distributors of Fox Suspension in the UK. And they actually noticed something when I was climbing, that I was really wrenching on certain steep climbs. And they were sure that that had something to do with my back pain. And sure enough, watching the rear shock on the bike, I was really going through the travel going up the hill, but yet that bike had quite a high anti-squat. It was nothing to do with the suspension but your body weight, your mechanical leverage on there, if you're really, really cranking, can alter everything. So what they ended up doing was, I think the shock at the time was a Float X and it had the CTD system on it. So it had a three position, kind of similar to this, a much older version of it. Now I used to run it in the mid setting for climbing because I still wanted traction, so I didn't want to have it locked out. But by having it in the mid setting, it enabled it to firm up a bit, but they re-shimmed it so it was really firm in that mid setting. And the effect of that was the bike just stopped doing this on those climbs that I was really struggling with. And you know what, it really did help my lower back. So your suspension settings do have some kind of difference. I mean, that's something that affected me on a particular bike. And if you're getting lower back pain when you're wrenching up those climbs, then perhaps that could be a little help for you as well. Okay, now just a bit of info about some of the other stuff I found. Now, I'm a bit heavier being taller. Some of you might be lighter, some might be quite a bit heavier. If that's the case, you might want to consider things like stiffer or stronger wheels. In particular, the rear wheel. That's the one that's going to take a big amount of load for you. Now, also while you're at it, consider things like rim inserts if you're struggling with tires or damaging your rims, or perhaps a slightly heavier duty rear tire. Something with a reinforced sidewall is a good idea for you. Now, something to take into account being a taller rider is the fact that yes you're going to be heavier and yes it means your smaller friends even if you've got the same power and fitness might be quicker than you up hills don't be afraid to use the smaller gear now i've had to put up with some of my friends give me stick for years for having smaller chain rings my friends tend to pick between 34s and 38s uh, depending if that's a winter and summer i'm a 30 to a 34 depending on the conditions and where i'm riding or if i'm lucky enough like this bike has to have 12 speed on the back don't be afraid to have a lower gear on there. And if it works for you, even consider an oval chain ring. Now, oval chain rings can be really helpful. I've tried them and it just didn't work for me. I'm quite happy spinning circles. I didn't feel like there was an advantage, but I know people that swear by them. So it's definitely something there to consider. Another little option to consider as well, if your bike has adjustable geometry, uh, this one has a little chip on it, which means you can adjust the bottom bracket height of it. Run it low. Um, as low as you can get on the bike. Keep your position down low, keep your body mass down low. Everything is gonna make the bike feel more stable and it's gonna feel more enjoyable for you. Okay, so you might have to have some recalibration to avoid hitting your feet on the ground in certain rocky terrain, but you can make it work and the bike will handle much, much better for you. Okay, and a few last tips actually come in the form of um, riding kit. Now again, one of the struggles of being tall when you ride lots of single track like I do, is I'm forever ducking under stuff. As a result, I've pretty much ditched using a riding bag, certainly for shorter rides where I can get away with running a water bottle and having some tools on the frame. In fact, I carry as little as possible and try and put stuff on the bike. I sometimes have a tube strap under my saddle rails there, and sometimes I use like a hip pack if I need to just carry a bit more. But if I can avoid having a bag on my back, not only is it more comfortable for me, by removing the weight off my back. It means going under stuff on the trail 
is far easier. And speaking of things that are hanging low on the trail, being tall means your head's up in the canopy a bit more. Well, maybe not quite up in the canopy, but as a result, you're more prone to stuff hitting you in the face. I know over the years, I've had some near misses with some spiky stuff, and I've even shattered lenses on some glasses in the past from sticks and stuff on trees that have been down low. Now, I won't ride anywhere now without glasses on. So for most of the time in the UK, that means using a clear lens, but quite often I'll use a mirrored lens if it's as bright as this. I am a bit cautious of photochromic lenses though, because I don't think they adjust fast enough for the riding that I do. It might be different for you, but it tends to be very bright and then dappled light in the woods. So dark light, dark light. As a result, the lens I really favor is the POC Clarity lens. It actually saturates greens and browns. So when you're in the woods, it makes shadows it enhances the textures. So you can see roots and holes and hollows and stuff a lot easier. Uh, there's various other options from different companies out there. I know Oakley do something very similar to that. Well, there we go. That's some of the tips that I've learned over the years as a taller cyclist. Now I've got to say a massive big shout out to Connor over at GCN and GCN Tech. He did this similar video. I've got this idea from him and he's massive. That guy's like six, eight or something. Now, he did an excellent video, and he's also the only person I've ever seen that's got a head tube the same length as his fork. Um, I urge you, if you ride road, check his video out. He's got some setup stuff in there that I've not covered that's definitely better for the longer term riding and the road riders out there. Um, as always, thanks for hanging around. We love making this stuff.